Hello and welcome to this special little video where I'm going to recreate this entire site, which the one you're seeing here is the original. It was built with Elementor a couple years ago. Uh, it's having a little bit of trouble when we do updates and stuff, so I just figured the time was good to go ahead and get this rebuilt with Generate Blocks. So what I have here is my starter site, which is what I start all my projects off with. It already has all my plugins and everything installed and some default settings inside of Generate Press and Generate Blocks. So the first thing I usually do is go in here and get the navigation set up. And I found that uh, using the customizer to set up the navigation here is a quick way to add all the pages without having to go to the back end and go to pages, add new one at a time. If you do it here through the customizer, you can get a lot of that stuff set up really quickly and already have those pages set up and ready to go for you. Now this last one is actually going to be a button. So I'm going to give it an additional class here so I can target that later and turn that into a button. Next thing we'll do here is drop in the fonts. In this website, we're only going to be using one font across the entire website, which is DM Sans. Uh, the original website actually has a different font on it, uh, but I do have some concerns on the licensing of it. So I've changed this over to a Google font where I knew I would be safe with the licensing. Now I do go through here and make a few little changes to the typography at this point, but you'll see me later in the video. I'll be coming back and doing some refining with that over time. Now the next part is all the global colors. So inside of my starter site, I have a system of global colors already set up. Off screen here, I'm pulling up the old site and grabbing some of the colors. You might see my mouse disappear for a while, uh, and that's when I'm just in my other window grabbing some things. So I have all these default colors set up. There's things like the body colors, section colors, text colors, link colors, button colors, hover colors, all kinds of things. So. Um, I set up a lot of these by default and I found that having this generic palette works in most cases. A lot of times I don't end up using all of these colors and sometimes I have to add a few more, but for the most part, uh, this will get me through most simple projects. Now here for the text color, I wanted to find something that was a little bit less saturated and something closer to black. Uh, so I did jump there into XD so I could use the color picker and try to find the right colors. Now this is a website, this tint and shade generator that I use all the time. You'll see me come back to this a few times throughout the website. What's nice about it is it will give you uh, tints and shades of a certain color. So if you kind of want to stay inside that family, but get something lighter or darker, it's a really quick and easy way to do that. So we'll spend just a few more minutes here getting this color system all set up. And that process does take probably the longest out of anything inside the customizer, but it's one of those things that once it's set up, you know that you have everything in the right place. You can pull all those colors dynamically throughout the entire website, and you don't have to worry about dropping in random hex values in case you ever want to change something in the future. Now here on the original site, we had this uh, light blue color, but I was worried about the color contrast on it. So I did go here to this color contrast checker and just find the closest shade I could to that color that would still work on white and pass some accessibility standards. Uh, so I did go in there and make a few tweaks to the colors on here. Just while we're in the process of updating this, we might as well make it a bit more accessible in that process. Watching this back now, I realized that I did make a few changes to the color palette later on. I had grabbed some of these hex values incorrectly, so you will see me jump back into this later on as I adjust some of these colors. Again, with this tint and shade generator, I can grab a really, really light blue for the backgrounds of some sections. I don't know that I ended up using this anywhere on the site other than some SVG icons that I put are uh, kind of backgrounds that I put in the background of some sections. Uh, but in case we ever need to use that in the future, at least these colors are hard coded into the color system and somebody can grab those directly from the palette rather than making their own decisions and coming up with something that doesn't match the rest of the site. Thank you. 
Now, thankfully, with this side, I'm pretty familiar with the way everything was laid out, so I didn't have to do a lot of jumping back and forth to figure out the colors, uh, since I already kind of knew how that color system was being used within this site. Here, we're going to upload the SVG support uh, plugin, so I can add their logo as an SVG here, which I'll be grabbing from off screen. I was able to download the entire media library off the old site, and I actually started completely from scratch rather than cloning the existing site. I just didn't want to worry about any leftovers inside the database uh, from the old Elementor install. You know, see here, I sized up this logo kind of just by eyeball on the desktop, but later we're going to have to go in here and write some media queries because that logo is so wide it didn't work really well inside of the mobile layout. And here, I do have some of these colors already set up inside my starter theme to connect to certain colors within my palette, but I did want to make some tweaks on this one, and I think I even go back further and, and tweak it a little bit more later on. Luckily, I have a bit of freedom in this project to do some of these updates without having to do a bunch of approvals and back and forth. I could use my better judgment on most of this. And now we're going to start writing the CSS for the button that goes inside the free quote item inside that menu. I do have this saved somewhere, uh, so I can just copy and paste that starter bit of CSS in there and then go out and make some changes. I do try to add comments to all the CSS tweaks I add in here just to make sure I know what they are when I come back later on. And usually I'll do all of these CSS tweaks here inside the customizer so I can see them live in real time as I'm developing the site. And then once I get the website completely finished and have finalized all that CSS, I will go back and dump it all into my child theme. So later on, if somebody comes in and gets inside the customizer, they're, they're not going to easily be able to tweak those things uh, accidentally. And I imagine if somebody knows to go look in the child theme, then they probably know what they're doing. And of course we need to create a hover state for this button. I think I did have a little bit of trouble here getting the text to go the right color uh, on hover and I might have had to use an important tag. I think I went back and fixed that up later. Uh, but just for the, the sake of getting this rapidly developed, uh, I don't mind an important tag in there temporarily. Box shadow is one of those CSS properties. I always have trouble remembering exactly how to write out, but I think I got it right on the first try on this one. And now we're going to go up and set some of these global styles inside Generate Blocks. That way I can pull in things like buttons, and later you'll see me work on headings, and use those global styles so I can make changes globally throughout the site if I ever want to make tweaks to those things later. So I've kind of come up with a system of setting up global styles for buttons and for headlines and for sections, which I don't think I use too much inside the site, maybe just a couple of them. Uh, but the buttons is definitely one you want to go ahead and set up in the beginning. That way, anytime you drop a button in, you can make sure you're consistent about all the styling and you don't have to make a ton of tweaks. I usually end up with three different button types, uh, which I've labeled primary, secondary, and tertiary. On this side, I don't even think I use the tertiary button. Uh, and then also some 
what I probably label as text links, although I do use the button element for it. You'll see it here, those ones at the bottom that have the arrow. I do use those um, sometimes, so that might kind of work in the place of the tertiary link in this design system. We'll go ahead and get the home page set up as the home page of the site and get started building on that as the first page. You'll see throughout the entire build of this site, a lot of things I do kind of at the first pass are just a rough draft of getting everything, all the content onto the page, and then I'll come back and do refinements later. I have tried to get in a good habit of one section at a time doing desktop, then tablet, then mobile, just to make sure that everything's responsive as I'm going. But you'll see sometimes I forget to do that and have to come back and worry about the responsive settings for multiple sections at a time. here you can see me using those global styles for the first time on the buttons which definitely comes in handy and is a huge time saver I realized here that I needed to do some of the hover effects here on the buttons like I did in the button inside the navigation I want to make that transform up just a little bit when you hover over it and also add a shadow to it so I'm going to go through and do all those settings inside the global styles here so it will work across all the buttons as I develop out the site Now that button's working perfectly. Here we'll work on some of the responsive settings, which I'll come back and clean up a little bit more later. Typically, I don't like to override any of the typography settings here on an individual element basis. However, a lot of times for the home hero section, I do like to do something different with the H1, so I'm not so worried about that here on this one section. But I will go back and make tweaks to the H1s, H2s, and H3s later on as they pertain to the rest of the site. Now on the original site, which I realize you can't see right now, some of these words have a highlight on them where it's just underlining the word with a yellow underline. And so I'm going to circumvent the uh, highlight system inside of generate blocks here to create that highlight. So we'll just write a little bit of CSS and tap into that highlight system that's already inside of generate blocks. I do, I do prefer to use rims for text sizing if I can. Uh, however, I don't always do math really quickly in my head. So sometimes I have to flip back and forth between pixels and rims and make sure I'm getting it all right. Now I do typically keep the customizer open throughout the build. That way I can jump in there and make changes to the fonts. 
uh, the colors and all that without having to reload it every time. Plus I can see all the responsive previews nice inside the customizer. I'll admit this layout for their best of awards isn't the best in the world, but it gets the job done and at least shows off that they've continually won this award year after year. So I do play around with the layout a bit on this uh, before I get it finalized, but it ends up working all right. When I was uploading these pictures, I finally remembered to add some alt text to it. So I went back here thinking I could add it in the uh, in the media library, but since I'd already placed them on the page, I'll have to go do it on that individual page too. But at least if I reuse them on the site, it will be in there the next time I import it into a page. On the Elementor site, I was able to do this next section using a photo gallery, but here with Generate Blocks, uh, since I don't have a Generate Blocks photo gallery block and I would have to rely on the Gutenberg one, I decided to just do this with uh, four containers in a grid. That way it gives me the same layout. Nobody would really know the difference, but I have a little bit more control over the styling than I would if I just used the Gutenberg gallery block. Of course, we're going to have to make some changes to the height here. I wish I had done this when I made the first uh, grid inside the container so I wouldn't have had to do it four times, but uh, I seem to never learn that. Unfortunately, the block editor still has this glitch when you go from mobile back to desktop view it uh, screws up the whole layout at the back end so you have to refresh the page so you'll see me do that quite a few times throughout this build
here I was just copying and pasting this uh, pre-heading, but what I remembered later was that I have a global style set up for this, and I'll go back and set this up as a global style later so I can reuse it throughout the site with consistency. This section here is a little three column card layout. And what I typically like to do is get one of the cards completely built out just the way I need it and then duplicate it for all the other instances I need so I don't have to go back and make tweaks uh, throughout all three of them. So here I'll get most of that styling done on the first one before I start duplicating, uh, but I do have to go back and make a few tweaks later on. This is one of the tough things about these three card layouts is what you do on tablet and mobile when you can't stack three uh, next to each other on tablet or they get a little squished. Mobile is okay because you can do just one across, but it gets a little funky when you get to the tablet view. You don't know it, but right now, the fact that those three columns don't line up perfectly, that the last one is a line longer than the others, is absolutely driving me crazy. And I'll come back and fix that later with a few adjustments to the text. At least it will look right on desktop. Again, with the highlight technique, so that way I can reuse that style across the site and keep consistency. The original design here has an image on the left hand side and I've styled the image to kind of look like a Polaroid. A lot of our community that this pool company serves is an older generation and we talk a lot about um, the pool creating memories for your family. So I thought the idea of making this image look like a Polaroid image played well with that messaging on the site. Now when I did it in Elementor I had to write a lot of CSS to get it all working. Uh, and I started to go that route here on the blocks build, but what I realized is I had all those controls right here inside the editor. So you'll see me get this all fixed up eventually, though I do stumble over it a bit. The other thing that's nice about this section is I ended up using an aspect ratio for the image, which you won't see till later when I think of that. Uh, so I could keep the aspect ratio of the image the same, no matter if it's on desktop, tablet, or mobile. But you can go ahead and laugh and watch me struggle with this now.
This is the moment I realized that I could do all of this inside of generate block settings, so I go ahead and work on that here. Obviously that height's not going to work well for my Polaroid. Luckily later with the aspect ratio I'm able to fix this problem. Sometimes what I'll do, and it's a trick I picked up from Mike Oliver, is on these tablet sections that I don't quite want to go full width, I'll make them 75% width and then center align everything. So that way it doesn't, doesn't get too wide across the screen, uh, but isn't too smushed either. Obviously in this mobile preview, my H2 heading is a little bit too big, so I will have to go back and work on some of that ty typography later. And of course inside the customizer, it doesn't look exactly the same as it does on the back end of Gutenberg, which is obviously frustrating, but happy compromise, and I will go back and check all this on my phone as well. I already have these aspect ratios baked into my star, my child theme, so I'm able to just grab those from here. I'm just going to grab the CSS actually and uh, manipulate it a little bit because the aspect ratio I'm going for on this isn't exactly one that I already have built in. But what's nice about this is now I know it can stay consistent across all the different views, uh, and that was a much better solution. I'm also going to scale this down just a little bit while I'm already here. Now I could have done this uh, inside of Generate Blocks, of course, so I will go back and do that here. But just to keep it from being too big inside that container, I think bringing it down to about 90% looks a little bit nicer. I do have some max width classes set up inside my starter site, which comes in handy sometimes. Uh, on this actual section, I think I was able to just bring that container width in and fix that, but you will see me later use that max width and uh, margin auto on some sections so I can bring in the width of text and it not span the rest of the section. I struggled a bit what to do with this phone number. I definitely want it to look big and bold like a heading, but I didn't want it to have the semantic tag of heading. And I also struggled a little bit since it was a link. Uh, some of the default theme styles were overriding the styles I wanted this to have with the underline. So I do go back and forth here a few times trying to figure out exactly how to get this working right, but eventually we get to that point. When the phone number is not linked, it's working fine, but when it's linked, I'm not getting the yellow underline, and it hasn't dawned on me exactly why that is yet, but here in a second you'll see me figure it out.
presto. I actually took this picture for the client one day. I was just driving by the outside of their building and noticed the American flag out in front of it waving. And it actually covered up the tenant next to their building quite nicely so you can't see the other tenant sign very well. So I've used this picture throughout the site in a few different places. They didn't have much photography of their location, uh, so this did a good job for them just having something that shows where they are. Uh, they are located on a really busy road, so if people have drove by it before, they would recognize it. Just doing some double checking here, I noticed the menu is messed up uh, and there's a few other little tweaks I'll come back and make, but I think this is all the sections for the home page. So just cleaning up a little bit of this before we move on to some of the interior pages. A lot of times I'll go ahead and have my mobile menu show up on tablet, so the desktop menu is only for desktop. So I'm just going back here and checking what those uh, widths are by default so I can go ahead and make sure that that breaks a little bit sooner. Now you can see my logo is a little bit too wide and I need it just a tad bit smaller to fit nicely inside of mobile. So um, I thought I was just going to compromise and leave it small on desktop there, but later I'll go back and write a media query so it can be a little bit bigger on desktop but still fit next to the mobile menu on mobile. Now I tend to use this off canvas setting inside of Generate Press, which I really like. So we'll go ahead and do some tweaks on that while we're here, but I don't think a whole lot's gonna need to be done to give them a functional nice menu. Next, we'll go ahead and tackle the footer. So in here, I'll use the footer element inside of Generate Press, Generate Blocks, and create this footer. I do actually have a section that goes above the footer here, which is kind of a testimonial type section that I want to display on every page of the website. So I'm going to go ahead and just put that inside the footer and I'll mark it as a section and then the actual footer as a footer tag here in a minute when I go back and do that. But I do, since this section is going to show up on every page of the site, I might as well just drop it into the footer and make it all one piece, which makes that nice and easy. I'm realizing now that the color blue I chose when I was switching it out was for a white background, but I don't think it's going to work very well on this dark background. So I did go with yellow here, but I believe I changed this up later to match uh, the light blue that I have on the existing website. And now we'll get to the actual footer portion of this, which I'll need to set up. This footer is really, really simple. It doesn't even have a menu, just a call to action and some contact information. So this one doesn't take long to set up.
I don't know about you, but footers are one of my least favorite things to build out. I don't know why I have such a mental block on them, but uh, they're never something I'm extremely excited to build. Look, I did get another use out of that light blue color. I'm glad I added it to the global styles so I didn't have to go hunt it down again. You'll see I often use the headline block instead of the paragraph block just because I have so much more control with the generate blocks blocks than I do with the default Gutenberg one. So you'll see a lot of times even though I'm just typing in a paragraph I will use the generate blocks headline block and then change the tag to paragraph which just gives me more control over the styling. Of course, the image block inside of Gutenberg has a lot to be desired too, so I decided to just give it a class and then I'll go in here and write some quick CSS to make sure that the max width is no more than 100% of the container that it's in. It's a simple fix. And here's where I'm going to go ahead and write that media query to get the logo size just the way I want on desktop and mobile. Just double checking here which selectors I need to grab. Though I've gotten a lot more comfortable with CSS, I still have to double check myself quite regularly and make sure I'm not making a foul of things. That looks a whole lot better. It was definitely worth going in and writing that little bit of CSS just to fix that for good, especially for elements like this that are going to appear on every page of the website. I 
I try to start out with a good system for typography, but a lot of times I find that I just need to go back and make tweaks kind of by eye just to see exactly what I need. Now we're going to start working on the interior page heroes. And what I'm going to do here is set up some custom fields because inside of the hero section of all the pages, I want a separate headline. I want a separate subheadline, and then I need a call to action button that might vary from page to page. And instead of just creating a section on each one of the pages and putting in the content statically, I like to do the design as dynamic as possible. This means that later on I can go back and make changes to the page hero that will apply to the entire website instead of one page at a time and having to go back and make changes on each one of those instances. So here I'm just setting up a custom, a few custom fields for the page hero, and then we're going to create a, um, a generate press element for the page hero, which you'll see in a second. I'm just going ahead and filling in this text that I'll need for the about page custom fields. So when we go create that element, I have everything already there and in place. So here we'll go into this page hero block and that's when we'll start doing our styling to create these page heroes. So for the headline, we'll use the post meta and we'll grab this custom field that we made and drop that in there. Unfortunately, you don't get a preview on the back end, so you have to trust that you're doing these things right and then go double check yourself on the front end. So there's our secondary text. And then we'll also need a uh, background, which I'm going to drop a default kind of fallback image in there. And this is actually going to be the image that shows on most of the pages. However, I do set this up dynamically so you can use the featured image in here which I do on a couple of the pages that I don't want the same background on but at least by default it will have this pool image which is used throughout the site I do want to contain this bit of information so on mobile and tablet it doesn't spill across the entire page. Uh, on mobile it will, but on tablet it won't. So I am containing this inside of a grid and inside of a container just so if the title is really long, it doesn't span the entire width of that hero section. Now what's nice about these dynamic buttons is I can have a different field for the text of the button and the URL. Uh, I think I ended up using the same call to action on most of these pages and the same URL, but if you needed to change those on a page-by-page -page basis, you do have that ability to do that with the custom fields. And what's extra nice is I wanted to use the same page hero on the contact us page, the get a free quote page, uh, but I didn't want to have the button on there. And if you leave those fields blank, generate blocks will just not show that element so that way I don't have to worry about and going in there and trying to hide it if I didn't actually have custom fields in there all that just happens by default so now you can see that page hero is showing up on all the pages it just doesn't have any of the custom fields filled out yet so I'm gonna go ahead and start adding all that information into the custom fields for all the pages. So I'll have all the hero sections done before I go in and start creating all the page content. This is a simple copy and paste job from the existing website, which I have opened up inside another browser window. So now you can see the custom fields are working. I had left the featured image to be shown inside of my uh, default page layout, so I'll have to go back and change that here in a second. But all those fields are working, and the background image 
is pulling the featured image when you set a different featured image for the page. See, on this one, I left the button blank so the button doesn't even show up on the page, which is exactly what I wanted. No use calling them uh, to the page that they're already on. Now here, we'll make sure that it's not going to display the featured image in the actual page. So when we refresh that, you'll see it goes away now. The elements inside Generate Press are really, really powerful, uh, but it does take a while to wrap your brain around them. So now we'll go ahead and start building out the page content for this About Us page. I am going to do each page separately here, but I do have some uh, reusable sections as well as some sections that I can kind of copy and paste from one to the other. Here we're going to use that max width utility class I have set up as well as the margin auto, which my brain was not working when I was trying to figure out why this wasn't centering. Uh, but if I throw that margin auto class on there that I have set up inside my starter theme, it will go ahead and center that in the container. Those things don't come with generate press or generate blocks, but they're things that I use so often that I've just gone ahead and put that CSS into my child theme so I can call on it whenever I need it. Glad I went ahead and put in all that alt text there because now it's already coming in. This is when I realized I could have used this pre-header global style. So I went ahead and copied and pasted that style in there. Now it's saved to this global style and I can use it throughout the site with consistency like I should have been doing on the home page. So now instead of copying and pasting styles, I can just use this global style and I'm good to go. Again, we'll use the max width and the margin auto here. It doesn't work on the default generate, or excuse me, on the default Gutenberg block, but when I change this over to the generate blocks headline block, it does work. I think it would work on the front end either way, but it doesn't work inside the editor, and I like to have it there and see it if I can. Here we're just going to set up these cards. I did have some icons that I was using from Font Awesome on the original site, but since Font Awesome is such a huge library, I didn't want to bring that in on the new site just to improve performance. So I'll sh show you a place where I get some of these SVG icons that are really easy to just copy and paste the code straight into Generate Blocks and have your icons in there. The set is a little bit more limited. They're bootstrap icons, uh, but I was able to find some that match close enough for this design. I wasn't too worried about it. I could always go back and make some custom icons for this, uh, but the budget really wasn't there for something like that on this kind of project.
go ahead and grab these bootstrap icons now, which what's nice about this is you can just copy and paste the code directly from the site, which you'll see me do here in just a second, and then paste it right into generate blocks as the icon inside the heading widget, which after a quick refresh we'll be able to do. Paste that code right in, you get the icon, place it above, and then set the color and you're good to go. Now I can copy and paste this style. Could have set up a global style for this, but I think I only have these sections in a couple parts of the website, so it didn't seem worth the extra effort on this. Now finding the exact icon I want was a little bit more of a struggle since it is, this library is more limited. But like I said, I was able to find ones that I think work good enough just to convey the idea of whatever the headline is. And if I ever have a little bit of extra time on my hands, I can go back and rebuild some custom icons for these sections. Now I just realized I had put this custom class on this card on the home page, and then I forgot to add the effect I was meaning to. So the bottom of these images just have a little yellow underline, and I'm gonna use an after pseudo element just to create this little yellow border on the bottom of these images. It had just dawned on me, so I apologize for jumping back and forth into different parts of the site, but I knew if I didn't do it right that minute that I wouldn't remember to do it at all. So sometimes you just got to jump over and get those things done. There we go. Now they're finished and they look like they did on the existing website. Two more sections to go on this about page. One is a little bit of a section about meet the owner. I was hoping to have a picture of the owner, but unfortunately he was never, never able to supply me with one. Uh, so we just had to do a little bit of a different layout, but it works okay for this situation. Keyboard shortcuts come in handy too. I use Control Shift D to duplicate things and Alt Shift Z to delete them. So if you see things duplicating on the screen or suddenly disappearing, it's just because I'm using keyboard shortcuts to do that. Getting in the habit of that definitely saves a lot of time from trying to find exactly where the, the duplicate button is or the delete button. So. Since I wanted to have an image in this section and didn't end up having one, just a little bit of a background image here helps give this a little bit more visual interest since there's no photograph, which you might be expecting in this section. Again, I'm going to go with 75% width just so that text isn't too wide on tablet. Here I went ahead and used one of the global styles I had set up for my section widths. 
Uh, I was kind of racking my brain on exactly how I wanted to contain this section, but I had some defaults already set up, so I just went ahead and went with that. Now there's this call to action section on the home page and it's going to be reused throughout the site. So I ended up just making this a reusable block. So that way I can just pull it into the pages on an as needed basis. And if I ever make changes to it in the future, it will update dynamically across the site. So it's one thing that's handy about when you're rebuilding sites like this is if you see sections that you're reusing throughout the site, taking advantage of the reusable blocks or global styles is definitely something that will save you a lot of hassle in the future when you have to go back and make changes to those sections. Now here, I got kind of frustrated with the spacing of this section. It didn't look quite right, and I wanted that blue background look, little pool looking thing to overlap the other sections. So I had to go back and forth here for a little bit and mess with the margins and padding between these sections to get it to work exactly the way I wanted to. You're just seeing me scroll through here, agonizing a little bit over, I know this doesn't look right, but should I spend more time on it? So you'll see here, I do make uh, quite a few adjustments to this to make that blue background kind of overlap the section above it, which I think was worth it in the end because it helps that page flow a lot better. Still not my favorite section in the world, but it does the job. With all those tweaks done on the About page, we can go ahead and move to the next page, which is going to be the Custom Pools page. I went ahead and left the About Us page open because I knew I'd be able to copy and paste some sections to give me a head start on some of the layout. Same thing with the home page. I'm going to go ahead and crack that open in case there's anything I need to grab out of there. This first section is pretty similar to what I have on the home page, so by copying and pasting it, at least I get a head start on making sure I have the structure right and all the responsive settings. I just realized that image was a stock image we had pulled from somewhere, so I wanted to use one of their actual images instead of something overlooking a big city, knowing that uh, here in flat rural Texas, we don't have any scenes that quite look like that. So no use on using the stock photo when I have hundreds of actual customer supplied photos on this one. Again, we'll go ahead and copy and paste a section here. That way we already have some of that structure set up and ready to go. Now it's just a matter of copy and pasting some content and we'll have to go find some icons again, which is always a fun challenge. So let's see how good my Googling skills are.
Now the next section of this page is a huge photo gallery that the client has sent me. I think there's something like 40 something pictures in it. Uh, so I will just use the default Gutenberg photo gallery in here, um, which isn't my favorite, but I do have a little plugin, which you'll see me install in a minute that allows you to open up those gallery images in a light box, which definitely helps out with the functionality. And you might see this video pause here in a second. Uh, I realized some of these photos were duplicates uh, and the editor froze trying to upload all these at once. So I had to pause the video and go back and re-upload these without the duplicates in there. So my apologies for that, but I didn't figure you wanted to sit and watch me fix all of my mistakes. Though I did leave quite a few warts inside of this, so hopefully you're getting a good chuckle at all the mistakes I've made and you haven't damaged your screen throwing things at it yet. And here we go with that reusable block section at the bottom. I was able to just quickly throw that in there and be good to go. Those images froze up loading and this is when I'm realizing it. And I'll pause the video here in a second and uh, get all that squared away for you. I noticed that you couldn't tell much of a difference between the big headlines, the H1s, and the H2s. So I did go in here and do even some more tweaking on the typography. Okay, through the magic of editing, the gallery is fixed now. And what I realized was none of these images had alt text. Now, I should probably write some much better alt text for all these. In fact, I know I should, uh, but there's really not a budget in here to do a ton of accessibility work. I didn't want them to be blank, so I did just copy and paste the same alt text for all of them. So all of you accessibility people, just please forgive me on this one. Uh, I had to make a compromise on something like this. Uh, hopefully there will be budget in this project later to go back and give this some better alt text. probably could go back and do a little bit more uh, work on how I want those images, those image gallery to work responsive, but that can be for another day. I'm going here. I have this blog post with all the plugins I've used for blocks, and there's this one for Lightbox for gallery and image block. So I'm going to go ahead and install that plugin on this website. So at least with the image gallery, if people want to see a bigger view of it, uh, it will pop open in a Lightbox. There's not a whole lot of customization options to it, but it definitely does the trick. couldn't remember exactly, but you do have to set the media, uh, the images to link to the media file in order to get it to work. But luckily you can just set that here on the gallery and then it should work perfectly from there on. It's simple, but it does the trick. Now the screen rooms page is going to be very similar to the custom pools page. We just have to switch out some content. So this should be a qu pretty quick page to get through, which is nice about kind of planning out doing all these pages in order because you know what you're going to repeat. Uh, and then that way you can make use of your time as best as possible to not have to go back and redo things multiple times.
I forgot I had this background image on the original site just to give the background a little bit of texture. So I did play with that a little bit to get that in there uh, before I copy and paste this section over to the screen enclosures page. It is nice to copy and paste these things, but you definitely want to have it right before you do it so you don't have to go back and fix your mistakes twice. Again, we're just going to copy and paste the alt text on these just so they're not blank. This page is pretty much done after just a couple little sections. So now we have this contact page. It also is the same page as the get a free estimate or free quote page that's linked to as the call to action throughout most of the website. Here on the left, we'll put in all their contact information, and on the right, we're going to have to build out a form. On the original site, I was using an Elementor form, so we'll have to go in here and build out a Fluent Forms form, which is the form builder I use on all my Generate Blocks websites. On their original site, they have a Google Maps embed, but just for performance reasons, I decided against embedding the Google Map and just took a screenshot of that part of the map. And I'm just gonna embed that as an image and link it to their Google My Business listing. So if people click on the map to try to interact with it, at least it will take them over to where they can interact with that map. I guess it's not quite as good from a user experience perspective, but it does save a ton on performance. Uh, so I decided to just go ahead and go that route on this one. I want to call a little bit of attention to this form. So I'm putting it inside one of the containers that matches how we did some of the other little card containers on other parts of the website. Now we'll have to go in here and create this form. It's a pretty simple little form. Uh, I will pause and start the video a couple times in here just because I didn't want to put all my clients contact information here in this video. So if you see things jump from one part to another here, that's why. Another thing I like about my setup with Fluent Forms and Generate Blocks and Generate Press is I have all the default styling for the forms, all the CSS already in my child theme. So these come out looking pretty good straight off the bat. 
This is actually something that Mike Oliver posted about on his YouTube channel. He's done lots of content on Generate Press and Generate Blocks. So if you haven't checked that out, definitely do that. Uh, but he posted a bunch of his CSS that he uses for forms. So I took that and adapted it for my own. So uh, I still have to do, you'll see, I have to go in there and customize it a little bit to match exactly with this customer's branding. But for the most part, the form comes out in pretty good shape just as it is. So as you can see, we already got pretty decent styling on the form, but I will go in there and make some changes. The button has some of the wrong colors and that background color on the form fields is a little too strong in my opinion for this. So we're gonna make some changes to that CSS inside my child theme style sheet right now. Remembering all these CSS variables for your colors inside of generate blocks is very handy or inside of generate press excuse me it's one thing is setting up that default color palette that i use on every site all of those have the same variable name so i'm able to kind of memorize what some of those codes are and easily be able to put them in without having to look them up not all the time but a lot of times and it helps just because i have a set of default colors that i'm using on every site Here's where we'll set up the notification my customer will get when somebody submits the form. This is where I'm gonna drop out some of this information here in a second, just so it's not all made completely publicly available. And sometimes the cache on here holds things up, so a couple refreshes gets that page back in order, and it's looking pretty good. While we were off screen, I did test the form as well to make sure that the submissions were coming through fine. Everything seems to be working in good order. So at this point, I'm just doing a kind of final walkthrough on all the mobile responsive designs in here just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Here you can see there's a little bit too much space in between these sections. So I'll go in here and do a few extra little tweaks on things I might have missed. When I was just first starting these pages that, you know, might have been cleaned up later in my design process. So we'll go through all the pages one by one, desktop, tablet, and mobile, and make a few of these tweaks just to make sure everything is nice and uh, consistent across the site. So the next few minutes would just be me doing that, going through all these pages and looking for inconsistencies or ways I can improve the design before we get into our pre-launch phase. Here I'm noticing that that hero section is, the text is spanning all the way across and where it's going over the top of that picture, it's really hard to read. So I'm gonna go in here and make some tweaks to that hero section to make sure on tablet that it doesn't quite stretch all the way across. That helped, but we still have a little bit of the image is not perfectly faded in the background. So I'm gonna add just a slight gradient overlay to this hero section, just so we can better control how that top part fades out. And you'll see here it looks quite a bit better. It's a whole lot easier to read now. And I'm just double checking some of the other pages to make sure those background images look good as well.
those don't look good stacked next to each other. So I forgot to check the mobile settings on this one when I was doing uh, the development of this page. Here we'll do that same trick, making it 75% the width, which looks pretty nice on tablet. And go back and double check it inside here in the customizer preview. Need some space in between those columns maybe, but otherwise this is looking pretty good. One thing I forgot is this customer has one blog post that was posted many, many years ago. So I am gonna have to go ahead and import this blog post in as well as create the single post template for the blog. So just pasting this blog information in here is pretty simple. You might have noticed I put that under the category general. I go ahead and in my starter site, I change the uncategorized category to general inside of my starter site. So I never have any posts that default to uncategorized. At least general sounds a little bit better. So this is when we're doing the single blog post template. So this is going to be a pretty simple little thing. It's going to look very similar to the other pages on the site. I'm going to do a slightly different call to action section in the sidebar here just to get them to try to request a quote. Um, but other than that, this is pretty much all default information like we did on the rest of the site. I close that a little bit too soon because I didn't even check the responsive settings. So I'll have to go back in there and work on that a little bit more. Again, I'm going to put that headline just inside of a little bit of a container so it doesn't get too wide. I could do that with CSS too, but the container is something I'm just used to doing. That works pretty well full width. We'll add a little texture behind that call to action section just to make it match the rest of the site since we've used this image in so many places. All right, it looks like the blog post template is just about done here. So we're getting really close to getting this website ready to launch. So one thing we need to go in here and do is add a button to that blog post. Since they don't have a blog feed anywhere on this website, there was a button here just on the home page under this section that linked people over to that blog post. So that's something I left out of the initial design because I didn't have that blog post ready, but I need to remember to go back and get this inside here. So. All right, at this point, we're just going to copy and paste all the title tags and meta descriptions from their existing website. I had that open in another screen, so I could just quickly copy and paste those. I did have their four years running for winning their award that I needed to change to five on a few of these. But for the most part, it was just a copy and paste job from the old site to the new site. Yeah. 
And I didn't run this through the uh, setup wizard through SEO press. I'm not doing anything fancy as far as the SEO here. They already rank number one for just about all the things they would want to be found for here locally. Uh, so as long as we got the basic information in there, everything should be fine on this site. Double check all the perf matter settings to make sure that everything is optimized the way it needs to be. I have a lot of those set up by default already, but always good to just double check those before we go in and publish this site and start running all of our performance tests as part of the pre-launch. So I'll go ahead now and get some kind of benchmark score uh, using web.dev, which I like. Uh, to see about the performance, the SEO, the best practices and accessibility, just to see if there's things I missed during the process, which there's almost always things I missed during the process of building it, especially when I'm doing it quick and fast like this. So there's some issues on my server not responding quickly, but I did have this on a development server, so I'm not too concerned with that. But I think those things will work themselves out once I clear the cache on here and get everything set up correctly for this application. Now that I disabled that varnish caching, I'm going to go ahead and run this again and see if that doesn't fix the performance numbers. And it looks like it did. We're only getting dinged for the site being set to no index, which is default on this development URL through Cloudways. So that will be fixed once we get this website published on its domain. So at this point, what we really need to do is start working on our pre-launch sequence. So I'm going to go through a number of things on here just to make sure that everything's done with the website. Uh, and running like it's supposed to. Here's I'm adding the favicon for the site, which I had forgotten to do, but I am going to run through a checklist here in a second, which would remind me of all these things. These are just a few that are popping up in my head as I'm looking at the site. So for my pre-launch checklist, I installed Docket WP, which is a plugin I created with my buddy Andre. And inside of this plugin, you can uh, get access to some pre-made checklists. So one of them that I use all the time is this launch checklist. And I'm going to go ahead and check off all these things I know I already did. So I'll usually make a quick pass at this. I've used this checklist so many times. I'm so used to doing it that a lot of times I'm doing these things as we're building the site. So once we get to actually opening this checklist, I don't have too many items left. You can see that 16 of them I already marked as completed. So we'll set a default open graph image. I think just an image of a swimming pool would do fine if this gets shared on Facebook. People will know what it is pretty quickly if there's a picture of a pretty pool. So I'm just going to go through here and try to find a good looking picture of a pool for them to use for the social share image. Double check and see what they're using on their live site now. Maybe I want to just use the same one. I was just using a pool image, so I'll do the same on the new site. All right, we'll check and make sure the robots.txt file is there. Double check and make sure we have our sitemap set up correctly, and we do. Some of these things we won't be able to do until after the launch, and some of these things I don't even need on the site. For instance, the client doesn't have a privacy policy on this website. They've been offered one, but they did not do it. Uh, I'm not going to use Google Analytics. I'm going to use Fathom Analytics, but I'll do that after the launch. Again, disabling search engines is uh, something for after the launch. So I'm just making some quick notes here to myself to make sure that I do these things once the website launch is complete. I'm pretty sure 
web.dev would have flagged me if the site wasn't mobile friendly, but it never hurts to try it again just to make sure that all these tests come back passing. And as I mentioned, I already test the form submissions off camera just to make sure that those were coming through fine. So at this point, I'm going to log back into my server here and get this website launched. So I need to, I took off the existing website off of their server and now I'm going to add this development site as the primary domain for their website. So here in just a second, that will be live. We'll refresh this here and there's the brand new built with blocks website ready to go. Just double check and make sure everything changed the URLs like it was supposed to. Looks like everything was replaced perfectly. Should be good to go. We'll turn those varnish caching settings back on this application now so I can take advantage of the server side caching. And this is a program called Website Auditor, which I use to do a lot of like on-page auditing. So I'm gonna run the site through this and it's gonna catch if I have any broken links or anything like that. And I did actually end up putting a URL in here incorrectly that I had to go back and fix. I can't remember if I fixed that on camera or off camera, uh, but this test did help me realize that there were a few URLs. I think it was contact hyphen us. It used to just be contact instead of the hyphen with us. So there was a few of those little things that uh, came up inside of these tests that I was able to go back and fix as soon as I got the website launched. So it was within five or 10 minutes of the website being live, I was able to fix these errors. And it was, it was those custom fields I had put in there. I had hard coded in contact, but the URL is actually contact hyphen us. So I'm going to open up all those and double check that they're right in all of them. We'll go ahead and hit rebuild project and this will run the audit on the website again, make sure that these errors went away. And it looks like the only thing I have is a too big page, which has to do with that uh, swimming pool gallery, which obviously has tons of pictures on it. I'm not going to really overly concern myself with that at this point. But we will go ahead and install Breeze for caching. It just integrates so well with my Cloudways server and connects into my Varnish immediately. So I just use that on most cases, even though I'm not doing a whole lot with the Breeze plugin. It is nice to be able to clear things out locally. Now that the website's live, I'll go ahead and run a test on web.dev again and see if we come up with any errors this time. And we're getting almost hundreds across the board. Uh, most time I would freak out about that 99 and try to get it to 100 too, but I think we're doing pretty good on this site to get those scores. So another quick little once over and we will wrap this up. Hopefully you learned something watching this today and I definitely wanna do more of these. I have a lot of sites I need to rebuild that were done with Elementor that I wanna get done with blocks. So if you enjoyed this, definitely give a like to this video Leave a comment down in the bottom, if you will. Uh, I, I will do my best to reply to all those, answer any questions you have. If you are trying to get more familiar with Generate Blocks, uh, Mike Oliver has a fantastic course, and that's how I learned how to do most of this myself. Um, but I definitely think you can make some websites a lot easier. As you can see in this, we built this site in about three hours total running time. This video is sped up two times speed. 
but in about three hours, I was able to complete this entire website and we're getting excellent performance scores. So I just really am enjoying building out these sites with Generate Blocks. It makes things so easy uh, to get exactly what you need out of a website. Last thing I'm gonna do here is install Fathom Analytics, which is what I've switched to here recently. Really love their dashboard, how easy it is to set up, being able to share the analytics with clients, and it's super privacy friendly too. So it's a real easy setup to just paste in these codes. Don't worry, I switched the codes later, so um, those aren't the live ones anymore. But we'll um, go ahead and clear that cache, make sure that this is working properly. I'm loading it up on another screen here in a second to make sure it's all working. And once we're done with that, we'll be just about wrapped up with the site. I do use Blog Vault for managing all my websites. This was this site was already connected into Blog Vault, but obviously when I took the old site offline, it disconnected the plugin. So I do have to go in here and reconnect this. And I'm going to do that by just downloading the plugin. They have an automatic installer, but sometimes it can be kind of finicky when you're replacing an old site. So I'll just download the plugin here and install it into my website. Make sure that that's syncing again. That way I can get all the security benefits of Blog Vault as well as be able to manage all the plugins from my Blog Vault dashboard. Might as well run a PageSpeed Insights test on here if I can copy the right URL. Uh, we'll go ahead and run that and then we'll wrap this up. Let's see what Google has to say about this. And go ahead and run a GT Metrics test as well so we can look at the uh, total request and all that. I'm getting a 98 on mobile and 100 on desktop, which is fantastic. And we'll double check here what GT Metrics has to say. I like using it for the waterfall and the total requests. So here you can see we're getting everything loaded in under a second. We have 37 total page requests. This website is doing pretty well from a performance standard. All right, guys, this will wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed this rebuild, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one.